In this lesson, we're going to go over the property offenses. Specifically, we're going to focus on larceny, embezzlement, false pretenses, larceny by trick, and robbery. And the reason that we're going to go over all of the property offenses in one longer lesson rather than breaking these up and discussing each one separately is really twofold, right? Number one, it's critical that we understand how to distinguish between each of these property offenses, right? Oftentimes we're going to see criminal law fact patterns where it's fairly obvious that our defendant has committed some type of property offense, right? Clearly the defendant has taken property that doesn't belong to him with an intent to steal it. We're going to be fairly confident that the defendant is liable for some sort of property offense. The hard part is going to be deciding or determining which property offense the defendant is actually liable for. Is it larceny? Is it embezzlement? Is it false pretenses? Larceny by trick? Is it robbery? And we'll really see this a lot in multiple choice questions, right? It's very common in criminal law to see multiple choice questions where you get a fact pattern where again, it's pretty obvious that our defendant has stolen something with an intent to steal it, right? And then the call, the question is going to ask what offense is the defendant liable for, right? And you'll see A, larceny, B, embezzlement, C, false pretenses, D, larceny by trick. And you're going to have to know how to distinguish each of these crimes to arrive at the correct answer choice. And as we work through examples, we'll see that this can actually be tricky in certain situations, but we're going to break that down in a lot of detail. The other reason that we want to discuss each of these in one lesson rather than breaking them up is because all of the property offenses that we're going to discuss in this lesson actually share the same mens rea requirement, right? which is the specific intent to steal. Right? At common law, we would say the intent to permanently deprive another of their property. Right? So fortunately, we all kind of know what theft looks like, right? what an intent to steal probably looks like. Don't have to spend a lot of time discussing this, right? But the idea is it's the intent to permanently deprive another of their property, right? You go and someone's not looking, right? And you swipe something that belongs to them, right? You go up, somebody turns their head for a second, right? You steal the phone off the table and run off with it and go sell the phone for profit, right? That's a clear intent to permanently deprive the owner of that phone of their property, right? Our clear intent to steal. And we'll see with all of these crimes, right? The defendant has to actually have had the intent to steal, that intent to permanently deprive another of their property to ultimately be liable for any of these offenses, right? In other words, if the defendant did not have the intent to steal, the defendant cannot be liable for common law larceny, embezzlement, false pretenses, larceny by trick, or robbery. All right, so classic fact patterns where we see this is the borrowing fact pattern and the retrieval fact pattern. All right, so let's say that I am walking to my office one day, right? And let's say that we need a new desk in our office, right? So I'm going to kind of measure the dimensions and figure out what size desk we need to purchase. So as I'm walking into the office, maybe I realize, oh, you know what? We don't have a tape measure for me to measure the dimensions of the office for the new desk. But I notice as I'm walking in that the construction workers who are doing some project on our building actually have left a tape measure on the ground, right? So I go up and I try to ask the construction workers, hey, do you mind if I borrow this tape measure for a second? But for whatever reason, I can't get their attention, right? Maybe they're busy, they're high up on the building doing something. So in my head, I just say, hey, look, you know, I wish I could ask them for permission to borrow the tape measure, but I'm sure they won't mind if I just take this for a couple minutes, run up to the office, measure some stuff and bring it right back down to them. So I take the tape measure without getting permission or consent to do this. I take the tape measure, right? I carry it up to our office. I use the tape measure, right? To measure things. At this moment in time, right? 
At that moment in time, when I take the tape measure without permission and walk away with it, have I committed any of these property offenses, right? Have I committed a larceny, right? A taking and carrying away of the personal property of another by trespass, right? Well, I've probably satisfied those elements, right? We probably have a taking, a carrying away. We're gonna break each of these elements down in a lot of detail. But for now, we can accept that this probably is a taking and carrying away of the tape measure that belongs to another person by trespass, right? I'm doing it without the construction worker's consent. So I probably satisfy these first four elements. But the reason that I'm not going to be liable for common law larceny is because I don't have the intent to permanently deprive the construction worker of his tape measure, right? I don't have the intent to steal. My intention subjectively, honestly, in my head is to borrow the tape measure. I'm going to take this tape measure. I'm going to go up to my office. I'm going to measure some stuff really quickly. And I'm going to bring it right back down to the construction worker. At that moment in time, when I take the tape measure and carry it away, I do not have the intent to steal. I have an intent to borrow. Therefore, I cannot be liable for any of these property offenses, right? Of course, important to recognize if at some point in the fact pattern, I do develop the intent to steal, right? That's totally different, right? If we are continuing this fact pattern, let's say that I take the property away originally, right? My intention is just to borrow the tape measure. But let's say I get up to my office and I'm using it and I'm measuring stuff and I'm like, you know what? I really love this tape measure. I'm just going to hold on to it, right? I'm not actually going to give this back. I'm just going to steal this tape measure, right? So I develop the intent to steal later on in the fact pattern. Well, at that point, when I develop the intent to steal, we could have a larceny at that point in time, right? And some of you who have been paying really close attention to all of the lessons in this criminal law series might be saying, hey, Michael, wait a second. You said in the very beginning, in one of the first lessons we had, an essential element of almost all crimes in the United States is the concurrence requirement. The idea that the actus reus and the mens rea must exist concurrently, right? And we talked about temporal concurrence and motivational concurrence. But under temporal concurrence, we said that at the same moment in time that the voluntary acts that constitute the actus reus of the crime, right, at that moment in time, the defendant also has to have the mens rea requirement, right? So in this example, remember, I take and carry away the personal property, which is the actus reus of the crime. I take the tape measure and I carry it away. Right, that's our actus reus. And then later on, I develop the mens rea, right? The intent to steal. Originally though, when I committed the actus reus, the taking and carrying away of the personal property of another, those original physical acts, right? I didn't have the requisite mental state. So isn't this a concurrence issue? And this would be a really great observation, right? But fortunately, right, judges have already dealt with this and we get what's called the continuing trespass doctrine. It's essentially a legal fiction where judges have just ruled and created this doctrine by basically saying, hey, look, if you take property that doesn't belong to you, right, by trespass, you take property without consent, every moment that you continue to possess that property, it's like a new actus reus is happening. Your mere possession of property, right, that was taken by trespass, it belongs to another person, every moment that you continue to possess that property, it's like a new actus reus is happening. So if at any point in time you develop the mens rea requirement, the intent to steal, at that moment we do have concurrence, right? under the continuous trespass doctrine, right? At that moment in time, you're going to have the requisite mental state and that actus reus requirement because the actus reus is happening basically every second, right? It's this legal fiction. It's a way of making sure we satisfy the concurrence requirement, which is an essential element of almost all crimes, right? So, that's the long way of saying it. The short way of saying it is, look, if you have a borrowing or retrieval fact pattern and at some point later on, the person develops, the defendant develops an intent to steal, they originally didn't have an intent to steal, later on they develop an intent to steal, you're not really going to have a concurrence issue because we have the continuous trespass doctrine, right? So just in your head, note, hey, look, 
right? This looks like a temporal concurrence problem, but under the continuous trespass, doc the continuous trespass doctrine, it's not right they're still going to be liable for larceny in those situations right but what is the retrieval fact pattern so that's the borrowing fact pattern that would be right i borrow the tape measure my intention is to give it back as long as i have the intention to borrow not the intent to steal i cannot be liable for any of these property offenses what's the intent to retrieve right the idea here is let's say that I am at my buddy's house, right? And I have a black jacket with me. And let's say my buddy has a very similar black jacket to the one that I own, right? But I end up leaving my black jacket at my buddy's house. And later on, I realize, oh shoot, I left my jacket at my buddy's house. I know I'll go over and retrieve my own black jacket. So I go over to his house, maybe he's not there, but the door's open, I let myself in, and I find what I think is my black jacket, when in fact it's actually my buddy's black jacket, but they look so similar, I don't recognize that it's not my own jacket. Well, when I take that jacket, believing that it's my own jacket, but in fact it's my friend's jacket, at that moment in time, do I have an intent to steal? The answer is no. This is just like the borrowing fact pattern. I do not have an intent to permanently deprive my buddy of his jacket when I truly in my head believe I'm retrieving my own jacket, right? I don't have the intent to steal. So even though we might have a taking and carrying away of a personal property of another, by trespass, right? We don't have the intent to permanently deprive. Therefore, I cannot be liable for any of these property offenses. Of course, like we said, under the continuous trespass doctrine, if at any point in time I develop the intent to steal, right? I realize, oh shoot, this is actually my buddy's jacket. You know what? This is way better than my own jacket. I'm just going to steal it. Well, at that moment in time, we could have larceny, right? Under the continuous trespass doctrine. But at the moment in time that I originally take the property and carry it away with the intent to borrow or the intent to retrieve my own property, it is not any of these property offenses. The defendant cannot be liable for any of these property offenses without the intent to steal. A really important note to make, which is why we're covering it first, because I promise if you're in law school studying for the bar exam, you will see these fact patterns. They're super, super common. These borrowing and retrieval fact patterns, right? The idea is the intent to borrow, the intent to retrieve your own property is not the intent to steal. You cannot be liable for any of these crimes, right? Unless under the continuous trespass doctrine, you develop an intent to steal later on in the fact pattern, just something to be aware of. The next topic we need to go over before we start just jumping into the elements of each of these different offenses is kind of this spectrum of dominion and control, right? We have to know what the difference between ownership of property, possession of property, and custody of property is. This is going to be absolutely critical. Understanding this spectrum is one of the major ways we're going to distinguish between each of our property offenses, right? And this all has to deal with dominion and control of property. The more dominion and control over personal property a person has, the more this way we go on the spectrum. The less dominion and control a person has over a piece of property, the more we go this way on the spectrum, right? So we start with ownership of property. This is the broadest scope of dominion and control over personal property a person can have. This is when you hold title to the personal property, right? And we know when you have title to property, you can pretty much do anything you want that's legal with that property, right? You can sell it, you can dispose of it, you can give it away for free, you can use it pretty much in any unrestricted way that you want, right? That's ownership of property. You hold actual title, right? To give an example, this would be going to a car dealership and paying cash upfront for the car you get the car and the dealership hands you papers that say you hold title to the vehicle, right? That would be ownership of property. Next, we have possession of property, right? This is still a very broad use of property. It's very unrestricted, but it doesn't have the same rights that are associated with ownership or holding title to property. The main difference, 
right, is when you hold title to property, you can sell the property, you can dispose of the property, you can alienate that property in any way you want. You can transfer it, dispose of it, sell it, right? You have all the rights that we associate with ownership of property. When you have mere possession of property, that doesn't give you the right to sell the property or dispose of it, right? You need the owner's permission to do that. Someone else owns it, you have possession of the property, right? This would most classically be like rentals or leases, right? Say you go to the car dealership, but instead of buying the car, you decide to lease the car. Well, in that case, transfer of title is not happening, right? You are not receiving title to the car when you lease the car, right? What you're getting is possession of the car. And possession though is still really a broad form of dominion and control. If you go lease a car, you have a lot of dominion and control over that car, right? You can drive it basically anywhere you want. You can use it however you want, right? As long as you're obeying the terms of the lease and the you know terms of the law, you're not doing anything just completely reckless. But for the most part, within reason, right, you have a lot of dominion and control over the car, right? You don't have to call the owner and ask every time you use it, hey, can I use the car today? And all this stuff, right? You have very broad scope in terms of dominion and control over a car when you lease it, right? Important to recognize with possession, right? We say someone has possession of property. We have actual possession and constructive possession. When you go to the dealership and you lease a car and you drive it off the lot, right? You're in actual possession. You're in the car driving it. That would be actual possession. When you get home and you park the car in a, in a garage, right? And then you go into your house, you're still in possession. Even though your hands aren't on the wheel of the car, you're not in the car. We call that constructive possession. You're still in possession of it, even though you're not physically holding the item, right? That would still be constructive possession of the property. Right, custody of property, we're moving even further down our spectrum of dominion and control. This would be the lowest form of dominion and control over property you can really have, right? This is a very limited, narrow scope of access to a piece of property, right? So take our car example, right? Say you lease a car and you decide you want to get the car washed, right? So you go to a hand car wash place, you drive the car up, you park it, you know, you're waiting on a bench or something like 10 feet away from the car while a cleaning crew comes and is detailing your car. Maybe they're vacuuming the car, they're wiping it down, whatever, right? They're cleaning the car. Those people who have access to your car are not in actual possession of the car. They have custody of the car, a very narrow, limited form, right? They can't just take your car and go drive it wherever they want and use it in unrestricted ways like a person who has possession of the car might be able to do, right? Their scope is limited to essentially just cleaning the car, right? That would be custody of the car, not possession of the car. Other examples of custody would be you go to your buddy's house, right? And you're eating food, right? So your buddy sets down a plate and a knife and a fork. You're holding the knife and fork. You're not in possession of the knife and fork, right? Even though you're holding the knife and fork in your hands, you don't have lawful possession. You can't take the knife and fork and go do whatever you want with it, right? You have custody, a more narrow. You're allowed to use that knife and fork to eat your food, right? That's custody of the property. Another classic example would be anytime a person goes into a store and is looking at an item in the store, you know, under the employee's supervision. That is custody, right? You go into a jewelry shop and you see a diamond ring in the display case and you say, hey, can I look at that diamond ring? And the clerk pulls it out of the display case and puts it in your hand. When it's in your hand, you don't have actual possession of the diamond ring. You have custody of the diamond ring, right? Test drives with cars, right? Is a great illustration of the difference between possession and custody, right? If you go on a test drive and the 
employee from the car dealership is riding with you in the passenger seat, you know, directing where you can drive the car. That's more like custody of the property. You're driving it, but you're being directed by a supervisor, right? You have an employee sitting there telling you, turn right here, turn right here, okay, pull back into the dealership right here, right? You're under supervision. That's much more narrow in scope when we're thinking about dominion and control of the car. Right, so if the employee is sitting in the passenger seat next to you directing you where to drive, that's probably custody of the car. On the other hand, if the employee, the car dealership says, hey, look, go test drive this car, take it for a week, you know, drive it around, use it however you want, bring it back to us in a week, let us know what you think about the car, that's way more unrestricted use. That would look more like lawful possession of the car, right? So there are no bright line rules here. There's nothing that tells us this is exactly what possession is, this is exactly what custody is. But one of the biggest things to look out for is just what the scope of the use is. The broader that scope is, the more unrestricted it is, the more that looks like possession. The more restricted it is, that more looks like custody. And one of the big distinctions I've found just working through hundreds of these types of fact patterns is whether or not there's supervision, right? The more supervision there is, that's more indicative of custody of the property. If an employee or an agent of the company that actually owns the property is watching you, you know, use it and access it, that looks more like custody than possession. But when a person gets to, you know, take an item and go use it on their own for an extended period of time unsupervised, right, that looks more like lawful possession of the property. One final note to make is low level employees. Right? So, when a company, a corporation, a company, an employer directly gives property to an employee in the scope of the employer employee relationship, right? That low level employee only has custody of the property, not lawful possession of the property. This is really important to remember. Right, low level employees that are directly given property by their employer within the employer employee relationship, within the scope of that relationship, we say those low level employees only have custody of the property, not possession of the property. Right? So, you know, a bank teller. A bank teller is a classic example, and we'll flush out a lot of bank teller examples because you see this tested all the time. Right, but let's say that an employer gives the bank teller within the scope of their employer-employee relationship a computer to use at the front desk. Right, so the employer gives the employee a company laptop that sits at the front desk that the employee can use when they're depositing money into people's accounts. Right, that would be custody of the laptop. That low-level employee, that bank teller, does not have lawful possession of the laptop that bank teller has custody of the laptop. All right, so hopefully we can see the difference in this spectrum. The more dominion and control a person has over property, the more we move this way on the spectrum. The less dominion and control, the more we move this way on the spectrum. All right, with that, if we understand the mens rea requirement, right, the mental state requirement for all of these crimes, which is the specific intent to steal, and we understand this spectrum of dominion of control over property, we are ready to move on to the actual crimes themselves. And we can break each of these down element by element, starting with common law larceny. Okay, common law larceny is five elements. A taking and carrying away of the personal property of another by trespass with the intent to permanently deprive, right? Or in other words, with the intent to steal, right? So what is a taking, right? A taking is simply obtaining possession to personal property that the person does not already have lawful possession of, right? A taking is simply obtaining possession of property that that person does not already have lawful possession of, right? A carrying away is going to be any movement of that personal property, right? So a lot of times taking and carrying away really go hand in hand. You know, our most classic example of larceny would be kind of what we opened with, right? Stealing somebody's phone, right? Say you're in a crowded restaurant, 
crowded bar, whatever, and somebody's sitting there drinking their water or eating their food, not paying attention, and their cell phone is you know, on the table next to them, and somebody comes up when they're not looking, not paying attention, grabs the cell phone, and runs off with it. Right At that point in time, the taking is the obtaining possession. Right At that moment in time, right before the taking happens, who is in lawful possession of the phone? Right, The owner is in actual possession of the phone. The taking occurs when that possession transfers from the owner of the phone to the thief, right, to the defendant. When the defendant starts to grab that phone and obtains possession, because they were not already in lawful possession of the phone, the owner was in lawful possession, the defendant takes possession of the phone, that's our taking. The carrying away is any movement of that property. So the second that that phone moves even like half an inch, a nano segment of an inch, right? That's the carrying away. It can be the smallest movement of the property that's going to satisfy the carrying away requirement. So that's taking and carrying away. Important to recognize Right? Let's say that our defendant's trying to break into a bank vault and steal the money inside the vault. Right? As that defendant is breaking in, until they actually move the money inside the vault, they have not completed the taking and carrying away. So if our defendant, our thief, is breaking into the bank vault and he's right, he's gotten right to the vault, right? He's cut through the wall or whatever and he's gotten to the vault and he's about to crack open the vault, but the police storm in and arrest him, right? Well, that's not common law larceny because we do not have a taking and carrying away. The defendant never obtained possession of the property. Right? Didn't carry it away. There was no movement. He didn't obtain possession and he didn't move that money. Right? He never got into the vault. So what would that be? Right? Well, anytime we're thinking about incomplete crimes, we have to think about attempt. Right? That might be attempted larceny, but don't worry about inchoate offenses or incomplete crimes. We're going to break down attempt and the other inchoate offenses in more detail in future lessons. But for now, we can accept that would be an incomplete larceny if they don't take, if the defendant never obtains possession of the property, never moves the property, they're not liable for common law larceny, could be liable for attempted larceny. All right, our third element, the personal property of another. Right, of course, we're dealing with personal property, not real property. You can't take somebody's land and carry it away. That's just nonsensical. So we are talking about personal property of another, right? You can't steal your own property. It has to be property that belongs to somebody else. Our fourth element is by trespass. This essentially just means without consent, right? You're taking property, you're obtaining possession of property, right, that you're not already in lawful possession of without consent, right? So by trespass would be without consent. Of course, right, if somebody gives you permission to take and carry away a piece of property, you have not committed larceny, right? If you ask the person, hey, do you mind if I borrow your cell phone for a minute? I need to call somebody. And they say, sure, you know, you can make a call on my phone. When you take and carry away the phone to make a phone call, you have not committed larceny because it's not a trespassery taking, right? You had the owner's permission to take the phone, right? Should be pretty straightforward. With the intent to permanently deprive, this is our mental state requirement. We flesh this out. You actually have to have the intent to steal, right? Remember, if this person's taking the phone without permission, but their intent is to return the phone, they're just gonna make a quick call and return it exactly as they found it a couple minutes later, then they don't have the intent to permanently deprive the owner of the phone, they don't have the intent to steal, then it's not common law larceny. These are elements of common law larceny. Right, so from there, we can talk about embezzlement. And then we'll do some examples that really flesh out the differences between larceny and embezzlement. Embezzlement consists of the fraudulent conversion of the personal property of another by a person in lawful possession of that property with intent to permanently deprive. So the big difference between embezzlement and larceny is embezzlement requires that our defendant 
first be in lawful possession of the property, right? The defendant has to be in lawful possession of the property and then decide at a later point, and it can be a second later, but at a later point to steal that property, right? So number one, embezzlement, we need to see, number one, that the defendant obtains lawful possession of the property. And then number two, the defendant develops an intent to steal the property, right? That's our difference. Remember, common law larceny is a taking we have to have the person by definition cannot have lawful possession to start, right? If they're in lawful possession, then they can't take possession because they're already in possession. Right? So that might sound confusing, but it's going to make more sense if we look at some examples, right? So let's go back to our bank teller example because you see this all the time, right? Let's say that our bank teller is given a laptop by the company, right? So same example we had before. Let's say that the company issues our bank teller, a low level employee, a laptop to use at work when they're depositing funds, right? Let's say that the employee decides at some point after this fact to steal the laptop, carry it away and sell it for profit, right? Is that defendant liable for larceny? or embezzlement, right? Well, the starting point question has to be, if we're asking, is this embezzlement, was the employee ever in lawful possession of that laptop? Was the employee ever in lawful possession of the laptop? We know to be liable for embezzlement, that would be the requirement. The employee would have to have been in lawful possession of the laptop. Well, remember, low-level employees that are given property directly from their employer within the scope of the employee-employer relationship do not take lawful possession of the property, they take custody of the property. So in that example, the defendant, right, that low-level employee stealing the laptop from the company cannot be embezzlement because the low-level employee was never in possession of that property. Instead, the low-level employee has committed a larceny, right? A taking, right? Our low-level employee had custody, but they then obtained possession, right? So they had custody, they obtained possession of that property. That's the taking. The carrying away is the movement of the laptop. Of course, the laptop is personal property. It belongs to another, to the bank. Their employees doing it without consent of the bank by trespass with the intent to steal is obvious when that defendant sells the property to somebody else, right? So that would satisfy all the elements of common law larceny. And this might be counterintuitive to some people, right? A lot of students look at these fact patterns and they see an employee stealing from their employer and they always think, oh, that's embezzlement, right? And that's an easy way to get these questions wrong a lot of the time, right? Low level employees that are issued company property directly from the company within the scope of the employer employee relationship never take lawful possession of the property. They only take custody of the property by definition, right, then they cannot be liable for embezzlement. Because to be liable for embezzlement, you have to be in lawful possession of the property first, okay? So what would embezzlement look like? Let's do the same fact pattern. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap.
Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.